Hello. Thank you all so much for, um, for joining in. I'm Thomas Tig at Direct Relief and really can't thank you enough for making a little time uh, to spend some time with some of the leaders of, in health centers that um, really epitomize what uh, Direct Relief has been trying to do. And I think we'll give you a, a sense of how things are shaking out with respect to COVID in the health center world. Um, and really so many people on this call are responsible for what Direct Relief was able to do in providing funding support uh, to these and about 600 health centers as well as free and charitable clinics over the past few months. And that we thought the best thing that we could do was to explain to you where your money went, why it went where it did, and hear from the people who received it literally and what they're experiencing. So we have a, a terrific group of, of guests today, and uh, Dr. Claire Cecile Pierre, who's the chief medical officer from the South End Community Health Center in Boston. Um, Richard Veloz, who's the CEO of the South Central Family Health Center in Los Angeles, and Ruben Moore, who's the CEO of the Minnesota Community uh, Care Health Center in St. Paul. Each one of these facilities that are represented by our guests received uh, grants of $500,000 as part of the grant program that you funded, those of you on the call. And uh, at the time when we received the funding and were able to do this, the priority was on keeping the health workers safe at the health centers. They serve that frontline role in uh, the, really this, the principal point of access for millions of people in this country. And the reason with the infusion of money that we provided it to these facilities because we were getting signals of how wobbly they were getting financially. And the concern was that if their health workers weren't safe, that they couldn't stay open and provide that triage service that they always do for people who tend to match the uh, demographic profile of those who are most vulnerable uh, for COVID and everything else. The loss of this frontline health safety net, um, if they couldn't stay safe and couldn't stay open, would have at the time left the only option open to anyone who gets sick or hurt to go to the hospital. And at the time, the priority was on re, um, boosting surge capacity at the, at the hospital, keeping people out of it so we could reserve the ICU beds. So the loss of the health center uh, frontline primary care access uh, in general would always be tragic. That was made more important uh, with the onset of COVID. So. Uh, as Direct Relief was providing PPE, literally thousands of deliveries of millions of units of PPE, our priority was uh, on making sure that the health workers were safe at the health centers because of that critical role they play. The support that we received, uh, we, which we did not expect, was extraordinary, but we realized at Direct Relief that the funds that coming to Direct Relief were for the benefit of the health staff, the workers doing the frontline work that we're already synced up with. So it was a real privilege for us to be able to use the money that you so generously donated and in turn provide the resource of financial assistance to groups that are doing work typically unheralded, essential, and off the grid of public profile. So um, I don't want to speak too much, but I just wanted to thank you all for taking some time and then ask uh, each of our, our guests to give a little background on themselves, their facility, how things have shaken out uh, and what they're looking at going forward. I will also then turn later in the conversation uh, to a really important issue that uh, occurred after we had made the decisions to support uh, with financial support, the 500 or actually 600 facilities and then certain of them in a major way with, with larger size grants. Um, that preceded the tragic loss of George Floyd's death, which triggered a reawakening and resurgence of concern and interest and passion about the issues involving uh, structural institutionalized racism, the effects of racism uh, on society. And 
each of the speakers has a deep experience uh, in that particular realm. The health centers themselves, as Dr. Claire will describe, were a legacy of the civil rights era in the United States. And uh, one of the reasons I'm so happy that Dr. Claire is with us is that she's representing the first health center ever established in the United States uh, in Boston. So um, let me stop talking and turn it over to Claire for an introduction and thank you all. We will have an opportunity if you have questions, perhaps at the end to respond if we miss something. But for now, let's turn it over to uh, Dr. Claire. Thank you so much, Thomas. And thank you, you know, for having us and for really all of the work of the partners on the call who understood the immediate need and were able to respond so quickly um, at a time when we needed it most. Um, as you mentioned, I am the Chief Medical Officer at Harbor Health. And Harbor Health has the uh, first ever community health center in the US. And um, not a lot of us know the history of community health centers. I didn't know much until I joined um, a few years ago. And the way they started was in the 60s. So in the 1960s, everybody may remember this if you're from the US, that this was a difficult time. There were racial tensions were high. Um, there was a big move towards equity and towards really having a new way of approaching collaborations and addressing major social issues and healthcare was one of them. Um, in Boston, there were a group of community activists and a group of doctors who were actually traveling to the south of the US, helping people um, with um, registering to vote and engaging people to really think about life differently. And what they found was that all the time people were asking about healthcare. And they started realizing that mothers in Boston and mothers in rural Mississippi were having similar experiences. When they had a child who needed vaccination, they sometimes had to go to the emergency room for it. Or some of them lived in neighborhoods where no one would come and you had to sometimes be escorts or come with a group to actually deliver care there. So two of the doctors, Dr. Gibson and um, Dr. Geiger got together and wrote a proposal to the president at the time saying, give us $30,000 to open a new clinic. And this idea was inspired from what they had read about community oriented primary care in South Africa. And this is interesting because now that we are looking at where we are today, what they found was when people think about healthcare, you think about the physical health, the doctors, the nurses, the shots, the medications, the supplies, and all the space that you need to deliver that care. But to them, people aren't healthy if they are society, if they are housing, if they are jobs, if they don't have access to other, what we call the social determinants of health, they wouldn't be healthy. So they thought, what if this new clinic would offer all of the medical services in one place, dental, medical, behavioral health, but also would give people access to and connections to housing, hire people from the community so that they then had a job. And therefore that clinic became an economic driver in two ways. Healthier people can work better, but also because they're creating jobs right there in the community. Um, and so out of that, as you know, after that first one opened in Boston, uh, we grew at Harbor Health from one location to eight uh, over the years. Um, and community health centers in general started opening throughout the U.S. And now um, there are 1,200 community health centers with over 11,000 locations serving 28 million people. We accept everyone regardless of ability to pay. Um, and we provide services that um, are reimbursed through insurance company. But as you may realize, because we serve everyone, rural, urban, um, people who English is not their first language, and because we go the extra mile, go to their home, go to their churches, educate, support, some of the services we provide are not reimbursed. Um, so no one pays for, you know, a visit at the church, explain to everyone why it's important to get their diabetes. Uh, care done more recently or more regularly. Um, and so because of our model, by definition, we are constantly at the edge of our finances. And this is why when COVID-19 hit, it was really difficult for us. Um, as community health centers, we were already serving um, some of the people who struggle most. And then we, you know, as COVID showed us, um, there were inequities. The 
disease itself affected some communities and some people more. Um, brown and black people were affected more. And so automatically that meant the very patients that we serve, but the very staff that work with us are doubly affected, right? So we are caring for those who are infected by the disease while we are ourselves affected by the disease. Um, and so it was a challenge. Um, and because our financial uh, situation was so tight, um, community health centers run a very, very low margin. If, um, there's a company that studies us across the US and they have these recommendations. They say, this is how much you spend to take care of people. And this is how much revenue you bring in. Um, we recommend that you try to stay above 3% um, so that you have in case of a shock, some, some, some funding so that you can respond. And um, it's very hard for us. And in some states like Massachusetts, on average, we're actually below that margin all the time. Um, so we're at a negative margin over the past three years on average. Um, so with COVID, it was truly incredible to have the financial support that was provided at a time when we were making really hard decisions. We had to stop and say, we want to deploy and have our staff patient facing, going to see everyone, making sure that we uh, teach our staff about COVID, protect them and so on. Yet, we didn't have the money to keep everyone, to keep our doors open and keep all of our staff working. And so we had to furlough people who we knew were the cousins and the neighbors and the, you know, uh, of those who were most affected. The flexible funding that was provided through this relief fund made a huge difference because it allowed us to do a few things. It gave us now extra flexibility and it came at a time at a time that was very, you know, very needed. So what we were able to do was first reassess throughout. It gave us more flexibility to say, hey, okay, we followed three nurses. We're having more cases. And often we think of um, COVID and the hospitals. Um, most people who have COVID actually stay home and but and staying home for them, for a few of them will be safe, but most of them staying home is only safe if they have someone who calls regularly. So the outpatient, the clinic management of COVID is not seen, but it's really labor intensive. You have to call two to three times a day and re encourage them to drink, ask them what their temperature is, and so on and so forth. So with that money, we have the flexibility to call, to bring the staff back, and to have the right supplies to protect our teams as they were taking care of them. Um, and I have to say that it's been incredible, it's really meaningful. Um, I'm afraid, of course, that in Massachusetts, we were able to manage a lot. The state itself um, invested in testing, tracing, and treatment, which is great. Um, but unfortunately, as you can see, the U.S. did not exactly um, curve or bend the curve. And so as the cases are going up, we're a little worried that in the fall, we have open borders, people will visit us, that there may be a spike. Um, I think most people were worried that in the winter, there'll be confusion between flu and um, COVID. And so I think a big part of what we're looking at in the fall is how do we make sure that we can again resist um, and if, as the and for Massachusetts that's resisting and planning for the fall for many of the states um, that you're from, that others are from and that our community health centers are in, they're still in the middle of this. So the needs continue both in terms of responding for the acute needs but also in terms of planning for the next phase, making sure we still have supplies, making sure our staff can still come back to work, making sure that the technology is appropriate, um, and making sure that some of our most, most vulnerable people, so our patients with diabetes, our elders, their housing, making sure that we can look at how to support them. Thank you, Claire. That was, I really appreciate that. Um, I was just told to center myself, so, so sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that what you mentioned that we were sensitive to, and, and the reason um, the grants were provided, it was very clear that the disproportionate effects of, um, of COVID in terms of the uh, rates of infection and the fatality, the early signals were certain people um, were being more likely to catch it, die from it, and the the people, um, the characteristics of those people, they were members of ethnic and racial minorities that so closely resembles the patient population of you serve. So uh, with that, I'd like to just turn it over to Richard Beloz, who's, as I mentioned, is the CEO of the uh, 
South Central Family Health Center uh, for uh, with a 40 year background, originally is a respiratory therapist. So he brings an added perspective to this particular uh, pandemic. And um, I think Richard, for many people might be, who might know of South Central historically as traditionally an African-American neighborhood, um, kind of a iconic part of California history and the African-American experience out in California, it's, it's changed a bit, but I think if you wouldn't mind just giving us uh, a little background as Claire did, you know, what you're seeing, what the community's done, how you've been able to use the money that you've got and how you see things uh, going forward from your seat. Richard? Yeah, so thank you. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, Paul, you've done a great job in getting a really good group together and and, 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 and Dr. Drew did a good job of explaining what we do as community health centers. Uh, South Central Family Health Center has been in the community here uh, serving our patients since 1981. Um, you know, we're part of the small part of the social safety net here in Los Angeles. Uh, we have about, we see about 25,000 uh, patients. Uh, we've, uh, in 2020, we're hoping to expand our dental services, including op optometry, as well as uh, opening our 10th clinic site. Um, we have, in just this area where our main clinic is in South Central, Within a one and a half mile uh, service area, we have about 110,000 uh, patients living there or residents living there. Um, and uh, it's a very densely packed uh, part of Los Angeles, uh, very low income. 95% of our patients are, are Latino and African American. Uh, and and we, really, we have a plural, plurality of uh, first-generation immigrants and children of first-generation immigrants as well. And uh, as we all know, uh, these are the hardest working people uh, in, our, in our areas. Uh, we have uh, multiple jobs, they have multiple jobs, they have uh, uh, retail stores. Um, uh, it, it's a very difficult area to live. And to make, to emphasize that point, 95% uh, of our patients uh, are in the 100% of the federal poverty level or less. Uh, that means that if you have, uh, if you make more than, well, if you make at least $24,600 uh, a year, uh, that's all you can uh, afford to live on uh, if, if you're in that category. So, you know, we, um, we've been here since 81 serving our patient base. Um, and our community that we serve is also the staff that we have. We have over 50% of our staff are from the community that work in our, our sites. And uh, they're the champions for our patients because they really provide the services linguistically as well as culturally uh, that the patients understand and need. Um, but you know, what's really exacerbated the issues that, that were said before, as well as some of the issues I just brought up is this COVID-19, because it exposed really to everyone the, of the process, the problems we have in, in communities that we serve in trying to provide quality health care, affordable health care, and accessible health care. You know, uh, with COVID-19, um, we had initially only 20 test kits available for our 25,000 patients that, that we see. Uh, there were some communities in Los Angeles that uh, were providing test, uh, tests for their patients, but in our area, there, there weren't very many. Uh, so what we did is uh, we took on the, the, the effort to just provide tests for our patients uh, because you know they lack resources, and even though the county of Los Angeles had test sites opening, they were all drive-through test sites. Uh, most of our patients either take buses, uh, walk within uh, the community area, and so uh, we decided to do it ourselves. And and to this day, uh, we've probably given a little over 2,000 tests to our patients. Uh, about 60 to 70 percent of those patients also walk in. Uh, for those tests and don't drive. So uh, the, the need for those tests have been, you know, it's been tremendous uh, need and uh, want to thank uh, everyone who's been supporting us to do that. Um, 
to date, we've, uh, like I said, have seen ten, two, about 2,000, but um, the story is really about uh, patients who come in. And, and you know, I wanted to let know, we, we did have, there's a story that, that came up, and I just wanted to uh, explain to everybody what that is. You know, we had a, a family of eight people coming in, living under one roof, coming in for a testing site. Uh, they all came in, uh, and the mom was a hotel worker. Um, their dad had been laid off caring for four children as well as the mother. Uh, the children was at home uh, because the schools had closed. Uh, the family members were not patients of ours, um, but we were able to uh, uh, connect them with, uh, with, with ourselves and become the medical provider, uh, which we do a lot. And I think most of the other clinics will do as well. Um, so they came and got tested, all, all, all eight of the family members. And uh, within 48 hours, we were able to get the test results and we had to advise them that they were positive. Uh, we followed up with the family. We articulated to them what they expected. Uh, and this family was all Spanish speaking. Uh, we do have uh, providers that uh, are bilingual. And so we were able to take care of them. They didn't know where to go. So we connected them to a local hospital if their symptoms got worse. Um, we were able to f arrange follow-up visits uh, with our behavioral health, mental health people to ensure that uh, they could cope with these, uh, these challenges. Now the family I understand is, is recovering now and um, uh, they were able to be quarantined successfully. Um, they're gonna come back to our clinic uh, hopefully within the next uh, week to, to, for follow-up. But you know, this is just an example of what we do here as Community Health Center. Um, we would even see more than the 2,000 we've already seen if it was if we can secure more testing kits, because this is really important. I, I think uh, it was explained earlier, but really, uh, the poorest areas of our communities are suffering the most because we lack the resources. They lack the resources. Not everyone can drive. Everyone has to take buses. Uh, they're the essential workers. Uh, their jobs have been uh, put on hold. Um, and, and really, I, I think this is an important area uh, that we need to concentrate on. Uh, Health care for everyone is important, quality, affordable, and accessible health care. And uh, we do our best to try to, to make sure that that uh, is accomplished. Thank you, Richard. Um, Really appreciate that. And I think both you and Claire have uh, mentioned something that, that the team at Direct Relief is so acutely aware of um, in that there's the treatment side, there's the testing and uh, treatment and uh, case tracing and isolation, but so much of it is dependent on the quality uh, and the public health messages that um, we're all being instructed to do. They, they only work if you understand what they are. And I think one of the hallmarks of health centers, I don't know how many languages are spoken uh, among the staff uh, at each of yours, but I suspect more than two or three. And I think uh, the, the notion of health is more than just a clinical intervention to treat the sick part of a person's body, that broader range of it, to me has always been so striking as epitomizing what public health and the delivery of messages that have to be understood and internalized to change behavior. I mean, you do it naturally. So I think I, uh, before I, as I turn to, to Ruben, I just wanted to mention that, you know, because we're, our, we seem to be in this spike, you know, either second half of the first wave or a new spike itself broadly with certain hotspots and you're in the middle of one in Los Angeles. Um, but I think so much is dependent on, the uh, quality of the messaging and whether it's received by people who are trusted, it's a kind of political environment now and things get, everything gets politicized, it seems like, but the fact that people rely on you every day for their point of access to care and also services, to me is just a really critical part for the people on the call to understand what they've supported with their financial support the, the people who are most at risk, most likely to get sick, and right now most likely to die are the people for whom the messages must be best received, right? 
And on top of the maintaining the services that each of the health centers are doing, and this is nationwide, this added responsibility um, is come with zero funding. And so I think just for those of you who are on the call listening, please know that, you know, as you listen to these folks, your money translated into that type of service, which was on top of everything else they were trying to do. So thank you very much, Richard, again, um, for what you're doing and the insights. If I may just turn it to, um, to Ruben, uh, Ruben Moore, the CEO of the Minnesota Community Care in St. Paul, who's um, experience in, I think, as we talked about in preparing for this call, you know, took on a whole different dimension after um, the death of George Floyd and this, what's now a global recognition or re-recognition of these issues that have uh, a long history and severe consequences for people of color. And because the health center movement was at one of the clear manifestations and probably in my mind, the most successful public policy done in the last 55 years in health, um, it was really in recognition that people of color had no access to health services, particularly in the South and in inner cities like Boston. So I think uh, because St. Paul in, in Minnesota became, became a flashpoint for uh, the current recognition or in reawaking about these issues, um, I think on top of everything else, Ruben, you've been right in the thick of that. So uh, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Ruben Moore. Well, thank you very much, much uh, Thomas and uh, all the funders who uh, showed up uh, in, in such a critical moment in our history and a critical moment uh, in the world to be thoughtful and use your dollars in, a, in an impactful way uh, to really move the dial on the front lines of communities by investing in community health centers. And so uh, your investment uh, uh, will not go without a great return and we do appreciate it. I'd like to start by saying Minnesota Community Care is 50 years old. Uh, we've been around for 50 years from a social justice standpoint, impacting health inequities in our communities. Uh, our organization is designed uh, like a human-centered design approach. We really have thought about how do we integrate our organization into communities, allow our communities to inform the design of our sites. And so each of our 17 locations are different, they're unique. Uh, we have uh, clinics that are, a part, are integrated into schools. And so we have school-based clinics. We have clinics that are integrated into uh, uh, 150 unit uh, uh, homeless shelters. We have clinics that are integrated into public housing uh, uh, communities. Uh, we have ambulatory that also uh, operate uh, in a customized, culturally uh, and linguistically responsive way uh, in the communities. And so we li I like to think of community health centers as being leaders uh, uh, in, in this creative human-centered design approach to healthcare uh, where we integrate not only dental services, but medical services, pharmacy services, we integrate chiropractic services, we integrate the social worker uh, and public health services, all in support of the patient. And we're not just thinking about what they need clinically, but what they need in terms of their social determinants of health or social influences of health and how we can wrap around these, the whole person in order to impact the health outcomes of the entire community. Uh, we're unique and we are definitely appreciative of your investment of, in community health centers. Uh, when I think about uh, the in wake of COVID-19 and, um, and the recent reawakening uh, globally of the impact of racism and the structures of, and racialized structures and institutional structures that, uh, that marginalize uh, many people in communities, um, our organization was able to respond. And thanks to the funding you all provided and many others, we were able to adjust uh, in terms of our COVID-19 uh, response strategies to adjust our clinics and sites, to stand up testing facilities, uh, rebuild our telemedicine and, and telehealth capabilities in order to reach our patients in such a critical time period. Uh, as, uh, as our communities were uh, um, suffering from civil unrest, here in Minnesota, we were able to be thoughtful about how we come at, back out into the community and be a healing hand, uh, and to also be thoughtful about how we partner with our state, local, and other institutions on providing services and solutions. Uh, your funding helped us protect our, uh, protect our staff. We've had less than 
uh, in, in a clinic of um, almost 350 employees impacting 37,000 patients. I think we had less than three staff who were, uh, uh, who were diagnosed with COVID. It may not have been diagnosed in our facility. And so we're, we were able to purchase the required personal protective equipment to protect our staff uh, through this crisis. Uh, and so I, I want you to know that your investment uh, will have a deep, deep return in the communities around you and around us. Uh, and we are really happy here today to talk more about the strategies of, uh, of community health centers as, at the, at, as pioneers of, of creativity uh, uh, in the response to COVID-19 uh, and other structures that impact the health of communities. Thank you, Ruben. I think if I can kind of follow up on that and I'll ask you and then uh, Claire and Richard to talk about it, but I think it, it seems to me that we have this, we have a health system that was sort of at equilibrium, incomplete in many respects. We had a whole new wave that we didn't have a secret health system to deploy for. So that had to be somehow absorbed in all sorts of adjustments. And on top of that, the social dynamics and kind of the kind of the this recognition of who is like literally getting sicker more frequently and dying and more at risk it's all in it, it divided up along racial lines and so i think that is a is a really complicated mix to go forward with respect to health services and access but also recognizing these fissures in society and you're right there where this triggered so how do we get through this and what are you trying to do and what can you share with the rest of us who are kind of looking at on the one case these big red bubbles growing you know, where the hot spots are and, and, and as news coverage often is you know what the political leadership is saying about it it's tough because it's an election year and it's a weird time, but someone has to figure this out tomorrow, the next week, and next month, and that someone is you and your colleagues. So, how are you thinking about this? How are you? How did it feel as as the uh, the George Floyd death and what started in Minnesota? What was it like for you and your team and your patients? You know, I'll speak personally first. You know, I. I uh... I grew up on the block where George Floyd was murdered. Uh, 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 he was murdered uh, across the street from the church, the first church uh, that I found a home in when I moved here to Minnesota. Uh, it strikes personally, everyone in the community, I know. Uh, uh, but the ripple um, uh, rippled across the world. And I think what's so critical is that we weren't the only folks suffering, sad, impacted by the collective trauma uh, of the Joy Floyd incident. And so we, we've, we found that we have a, a large community, a global community uh, who are all rallying around the healing process. But what do we do to go forward? COVID-19 exposed some of the, the deepest and ugliest healthcare disparities in our country. We didn't wanna look at it, right? We've oftentimes, we just look at it in, it's in data and charts, but it made it really real when you look cut on the TV and you see the data. Uh, health centers have always been a part of the community, in the community, employing folks in the community, creating economic impact in communities. And so this is really real for us. And so as we are now becoming more and more thoughtful as health centers about, hey, we can't do it alone. We need funders, partners, globally, locally, uh, to rally around communities in order to impact these, these healthcare and social disparities that really, it really hurt us all. Uh, if we think about, uh, as we reflect on the incident of George Floyd, I think it's really critical to see it in the proper frame. This wasn't a one-time incident. This has a historical, uh, uh, it connects historically uh, to suffering of a people, uh, to suffering of communities. Uh, health centers have been at the front line of that suffering. And we're at a point in that pivot point where we have to now be more and more creative uh, in order to impact communities uh, and, and arrive at communities in new and innovative ways. We, we were one of the founding uh, institutions of, uh, of community health workers, right? Who are in the community, right? Uh, how we think about our mental health programs. 
let's be more creative. How we partner with law enforcement, how we partner with city and state governments. What can we do as a voice for communities uh, in influencing training, influencing academia in different ways so that our communities are much more conscious? Um, and we still got to care for folks. We got to integrate this, this amazing set of one-stop shop solutions for communities in, in leveraging technology to be more and more innovative in data in order to really move the dial. I appreciate that. And um, thank you. You know, the what's expected, I think, you know, the lens of health is a proxy for disparity, right? I mean, you know, I, I think the, the words institutionalized and structural racism may not be the tip, it's typically health inequities and social determinants of health in the health center world. They mean the same thing, right? I mean, and so I think that um, the those who are have been on the front lines working with people affected by health inequities or the social determinants, also known as this institutionalized racism. Uh, I think we're trying to figure out what to do. I think the protests are important. It's, a, it's an important thing, but the product, the meaningful steps that can be taken, uh, for me, the added poignancy after the nice people on the call made a decision that they did not have to make to give money to direct relief, which then became an obligation to make sure was spent well. For us, you know, thank God we knew the health center world and it was a natural channel for us. But I think going forward, I think there's some really tough issues. What do you do to address these obvious problems? And I'm just so thankful that there's a solution that's hiding in plain sight for part of it. And that is really represented, I think, um, by what you just described, uh, what you all do every day. And I'm hopeful that people, I want people on the call to understand that it's, um, the, the money had a practical immediate effect, but it also has a much bigger ripple effect. And um, health centers in general, because they exist only in medically underserved places or for medically underserved people, those circumstances don't lend themselves to gala fundraisers. So the access to private philanthropic support in the 1,200 community health centers that are widely diffused and locally run is a real challenge. And I think it, for me, that's why it was such a privilege to be here at Direct Relief and meet all these um, folks. Um, I think I wrote the, the only sentence in which I was trying to say thank you, and you each got one, in the same sentence to the CEO of 3M and Sean Diddy Combs, who did the exact same thing. And we're really concerned about the same circumstances that they were seeing unfolding. And what a privilege for us to, to see the range of people from the corporate healthcare world, many of whom are on the call today, to the entertainment industry, entertainers themselves. Um, and I want them to know, not about direct relief, but what what you're doing. So thank you for that. If I could turn it over to, uh, to Claire and you, the perspective on those issues that I know you have a personal deep experience in both internationally and in your current role. Um, what's your take on how we go forward with this vexing health issue that's complicated even further by a long unresolved social issues um, that involve, you know, racial inequities? Thank you. Um, you know, as I was uh, listening to Richard and Ruben, you know, our stories are so similar that we really are an extension of the public health system in the U.S. And we, we know that every community health center is struggling right now with what's going to happen next. By, because we're mission-driven organizations, we automatically will, will do what it takes. We'll stretch, we'll bend, we'll, you know, we'll make it fit, we'll make it work and yet we're at risk. Um, as you were mentioning, I have unfortunately, I guess in some ways, witnessed and or responded to other pandemics and other epidemics. Um, cholera, um, our teams have responded to Ebola outside of the US of course, and then most of my career started with HIV. And I think one of the things that we found is important is that when things, when the cases are high, the biggest thing we need is to realize that every epidemic is local. Even if it's happening everywhere, 
you need a local response. You need to know the difference between church on that street and church street. Because if you're not telling people where to go, they won't get the test, they won't get the information, and you need the local translators. And that's what community health centers come in. So I think when I think of epidemics and how they can help us build health systems and improve um, the society as a whole, I think of it in phases. The first would be around this urgent response that, again, we're extremely help grateful for all of the investments that were made. Um, every dollar invested in a health center results in $5 in the local economy. We can continue to amplify that. And so for the urgent need now, that's still there. The second is to think about one of the things that came up as a question in the chat, which is with healthcare in general. And what we're finding is that there's a big shift in terms of leveraging technology to improve health. And how do we make sure that we don't leave behind those who need it most? And so with that, health centers were designed to be high touch, high presence, everything that COVID does not want, right? We brought people together in groups and so on and so forth. So how do we now use technology to make sure that the people who are day workers, they work hourly and they don't have insurance, right? So when they take half a day to get on the bus, to get to the clinic, sit and wait, see the doctor, get their appointments, compared to the person who has insurance and can take half a day off and gets it covered, both of them need the telemedicine, one for convenience and the other one actually for financial reasons. So how do we make sure that telemedicine is accessible to all of them? And I can tell you, for example, at our site, you know, we had, it's, it's almost difficult to say, we reassessed three or four times how to have the right medical record, but every time we have to make decisions between adjusting staff salaries or investing half a million dollars or more, in a good medical record so we could see the results of all the hospitals near us. And every time we kept pushing it back. So this investment in technology is needed and we need partners who have done this, corporate partners um, who can help us think about the strategy, who can help invest philanthropic dollars in helping us move the, the, the design and the delivery of our care. And then the third area is to really help us think through how um, we address the social determinants of health. You know? Health is this last piece, as you were saying, but it's sitting on top of so much more. Housing, jobs, and more. Community health centers were designed to address systemic racism in healthcare by providing healthcare and addressing the other areas. It's very difficult to do. And we look at our elders, for example, where we care for them. We know that if you are in a nursing home in certain facilities, people die more that most of the deaths were actually in those facilities. And we know that there are new models of caring for elders, more flexible housing, that's smaller units and so on and so forth. We have the land, many communities, right? But we don't have housing partners. We don't have the grant funding to say, hey, we're gonna open this flexible new way of sheltering our elders so that we and our staff who understand infections can actually prevent that. And we're watching the next wave come in. So how do we go from the acute phase, urgent response, a lot of cases, supporting supplies, which you've already done, which everybody here has helped us do, to the second phase, which is where we look at technology and innovations about how we develop care differently and design care differently, to the third phase where we start saying, hey, health centers create jobs. Are we partnering with business schools? Health centers you know, can have housing on site. Who, who does housing? Who, who gives housing? You know, who, who would help us build one? You know, the first one and model it, and so on and so forth. How do we go and connect all of the pieces that affect the community's health? Those are the challenges we're faced with as we look at the next six months, year, and so on. Thank you, um, Richard. You know, what strikes me in just listening in um, is that, and really, as I mentioned before, it's 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 a strange time. It's a highly politicized time. Um, this dimension of trust in institutions, whether it's the World Health Organization, our own U.S. government, state, it's, it's wobbly. And I think you, in the absence of trust, I think, you know, it, things get uh, off kilter. Who do you trust with respect to wearing a mask? Who do you trust when you're told 
about what how dangerous the coronavirus may be. Who do you trust for anything? And I think one of the legacies that the currency that's been built up uh, from my perspective as a kind of a support organization is that that ingredient, in t- the great intangible ingredient of trust is something that has been earned for 55 years, 40 years or more there in South Central. That's a rare currency these days. And I think it's an essential one for the public health messaging and also, you know, to tr- have the trust to think a little bit differently because it's a different time. So you're there on the front lines you've seen in Los Angeles is kind of, um, it's a country unto itself. And you're one of the anchor facilities in Los Angeles for people who are uh, facing disproportionate risk at the moment uh, for a whole host of reasons, economic and social and racial. Um, So as Claire was saying, it's tough right now because we're in the moment to see where we're going next. But do you have a sense of the help you need or what other people on the call should perhaps understand that you've learned with the people who are most at risk at a, this unusual time we're in with the pandemic? Well, you know, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, I think all the panelists are, are right on and all the issues we face at community health centers. And, and one of the most important areas is really partnerships. Uh, we, we can't do it ourselves. I and mean, we've tried, we, we, we continue to try, but partnerships are so important. Um, whether it's with your local uh, county facilities, whether it's with other community health centers in the area, uh, whether it's with uh, the social media that we, we uh, deal with, without those partnerships, exclu- and especially with connectors like uh, Direct Relief and, and the donors, it, it's almost impossible to address all of the different social injustices in healthcare that have gone on for, for a long time in this country. Um, uh, but we're doing our best. And, and, I, and I think um, one of the areas that, that COVID-19 has brought out has really made everyone aware of these social inequities in healthcare. And, and uh, for myself, uh, I, I really worry uh, the continuation of this type of infectious disease, uh, which is not only impacting on people who uh, don't have jobs right now or are laid off, uh, uh, who have to have child care issues, uh, that impact economically is going to continue. And what that means is that other health care uh, problems, whether it's diabetes, asthma, um, uh, health condition, heart conditions, uh, those conditions don't go away. So community health centers like us are, are desperately in need for the patient population that we serve. Um, what my concern has been is, is the continuing support that we need to really attack this problem. Uh, as we all know, COVID-19 is not going to go away tomorrow. In fact, it might be with us uh, for at least another year or two. Uh, we have the flu season coming. Uh, there are a lot of issues that we have to uh, think about. The telehealth issue is a big, big issue. I think most of us, uh, before uh, the COVID-19, we had zero telephonic and telehealth visits. Now 60% to 70% of our visits are through the telephone or through uh, telehealth. Uh, we need support for that. Uh, equipment needs, there's, there's a variety of areas that just attacking these issues uh, are important. Um, to me, you know, I was a, a, in public health for a while. Uh, in the past, I was a health educator. Uh, I've also been, uh, in those days, they called it inhalation therapy. Uh, but I work for the county hospital as an inhalation therapist. Uh, so to, to me, um, hospitals and acute care is important, but I think the focus, and maybe COVID-19 is going to help us do this, is really the focus should be on prevention and more public health support, because this is what makes our society healthier and attacks the chronic diseases that we end up uh, having uh, when we don't have good medical care that's accessible and affordable. Um, so I, I, you know, again, I, you know, I want to thank uh, you, uh, uh, Direct Relief, uh, Thomas. I really think that you've uh, really brought out this effort uh, tremendously. All the donors who have uh, helped us sustain 
efforts that we do as community health centers um, and, and to keep it up because it's not going to go away and we're going to be here. We've been here in the past and we're going to be here in the future. Uh, all of us uh, need good, equitable health care delivery. So um, I just want to thank everybody for that. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I think, and I'm glad you mentioned that uh, some of the, uh, the uh, folks on the call had sent in some questions uh, really about two, both testing and telehealth and how you're thinking about that, how we can be helpful um, at directly for otherwise. I mean, we, uh, you know, have tended to focus for the, at the outset, as Claire said, the urgent was make sure your health workers are protected and you don't shut your doors because the, it was very clear to see what the, how that would play out. The only place left to go is the one place you weren't supposed to go, right? It was a hospital. So I think that um, as you go forward, I think maybe if I could uh, ask Ruben, you know, who's, who uh, those of you on, on the call would know this, but he's got a long background in kind of looking uh, at innovations that might make a sense. So right now you have a, a testing, huge ch challenge that we're faced with as well as a rapid migration to how to, what can be done well um, through uh, telehealth or telemedicine, uh, particularly for the people who have the least access and, and suffer the most risks, uh, which are your patients. So um, what do you say, Ruben? Is it, are you thinking about that? It sounds like you've moved fast, but is there something that we can, uh, or those on the call should know about, talk about, we should think about and try to rally some support to help in. Um, Absolutely, Thomas. I think that uh, Governor Tim Walls and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Fanning here in Minnesota uh, went around our communities and said, show me your wallet and I'll tell you your values. Show me your wallet and I'll tell you your values. Uh, and I think when we think about healthcare and if we want to really make an impact, we need dollars to show up and arrive where the, imp where the real impact's happening, right? Uh, we need more and more resources uh, in order to build up more flexible solutions where we can engage communities uh, in, in their health creatively, like telehealth, like consumer engagement tools, like helping folks get a cell phone so they can actually take a call uh, and get to the clinic when they need it. Uh, you know, I kind of think of healthcare inequities kind of in a framework of a, a transfer, a, the, tran the, the classic functional equation in math, right? Your outputs, right, are a function of your inputs, right? And so if we invest more in primary care, in, pro in, in health centers that are designed around communities that offer a one-stop stop solution at a lower cost per, per, per visit, uh, we will have better health outcomes in our communities, right? But if we continue the pattern, right, of investing into specialty clinics, large organizations, or just throwing it uh, uh, it's kind of single point solutions. We're going to continue the, the systemic trends uh, in our country. And then we are really the solution as our larger health centers, our health systems begin to move out of communities. It's only us here and we're at the front lines. And so as we think about technology investments, continuous improvements, creating new programs that engage our consumers and, uh, and engage uh, uh, communities better, uh, we need we need new we need capital to do that. We need folks who are willing to take a risk. Uh, we know that your every one dollar you invest will return it uh, will return five dollars in terms of impact. But we need dollars in order to be more creative, uh, using technology in innovative ways. Also being uh, more and more intentional about our programs, being more culturally and linguistically specific and responsive to the communities that we are in. Yeah, I think if, if you can unlock how you capture that community sentiment and that trust emerges from that online, I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to do. I mean, it, 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 we've got to do it. I mean, the, the options are few, but the direction is fairly clear. We don't, we just can't add on another layer to deal with COVID and, and deal with everything we've got in the same way. So like necessity being the mother of invention. It's like, it's necessary. So let's invent. And I, I mean, personally, my experience has just been the, the sense that the sniffer for what the issue is. And I think in five years from now, there will be a series of professional disciplines that you are already doing that don't have a label on it yet. Like community health workers. Now it's a big thing. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> Um, it's a big thing internationally. It's basically the approach for how they're going to get in front of this with a much uh, less well-resourced health system, 
by activating community health workers to do testing, contact tracing, isolation, and basically public health messaging. So we got to do some of that here. And uh, it's helpful. I, I think because our time is a little bit short, I wanted to, we started with Claire. Um, she's a doctor. She's got to figure all this stuff out. And, you know, she's also the first health center created in this country. So um, Claire, I think if we can turn it over to you to, uh, how are you thinking about it? How do we make the shift? What can the private philanthropic support that I think the members on the call uh, represent and have really demonstrated this was the largest infusion of philanthropic support in 55 years into the health center uh, community. It was over $30 million. Um, it's wonderful, but you know, it, it seems modest given the history, what, what the expense is. So, um, and what the value is. So I think as you look forward, what's helpful in really the two questions thematically were about testing. How do you see it? What are you doing? And telehealth broadly, if you can talk about those two things. Sure. I think, you know, um, the public health strategy, as you mentioned, has to be that we make testing available to everyone. If you don't know it early, you can't trace early, isolate early, and you're going to constantly be behind. And it wasn't in our budget. We did not expect COVID. And this is where philanthropy for community health centers is something that we didn't have the bandwidth or the partnerships to do. So please do partner with your local community health center, with any of us on this call. I think someone on the chat asked how to reach us. I'm sure through Direct Relief you can reach us, you can look us up. We are open to these conversations. And we think philanthropy, especially when it pulls together like this um, and looks at individual needs, but also our needs as community health centers can have a huge impact. We're talking about reaching 28 million people here. Um, and so that's one. The second around that is amplifying the message with your networks. Many people don't even know we exist. Um, and so really post about it, tweet about it, talk about it, share, invite others, invite new partners, um, join our boards engage with us. I think that's the way for us to have longer term partnerships so that you can see our innovation, our creativity, you can add your strategies and thoughts, and we can really make a difference over a long period of time. And lastly, the telehealth and telemedicine piece is a huge need. For some of us, it starts with our medical records. We need to update it. It's just at a time where there are really major ones that work, it's time for us all to be on platforms where we can see each other's data then adding the layer of telemedicine to it. That's a concrete way for investments to go to the medical records and to the telehealth platforms that will reach a lot of people at once. Thank you. I think, um, well, we're almost out of time. I think Paul was gonna bring everybody up so you can see the Brady Bunch uh, of our, our panelists all together um, in different places. And I just wanted to thank you, all everyone who's hung in there, um, hundreds of people, <laughs> Um, I, ho I hope you got a sense of why, where your money went and what and why and what it's being used for and what it's supporting. Um, so th we do have a quick little video that we put together. A lot of the groups that we ended up supporting sent in selfie videos. So if you can bear with us uh, <laughs> for another minute. This concludes our formal meeting. And I just wanted to, again, say thank you so much to everyone who's the uh, time to join the call for what you did that you did not have to do. I mean, this is our jobs. I mean, on my part, it's not yours. You didn't have to do what you did. And it's really important that you know where the uh, money went and what it's being used for. We want, uh, this is the best way we can think of to do it. So to Claire, to Richard, to Ruben, thank you for what you're doing. Um, let's stay in touch because I think there's some good ideas that we may be able to uh, help spark and organize around. But uh, I cannot thank each of you enough for uh, spending the time with us and for what you're doing and what you've done. And with that, I think our Paul is going to show this little video and then that's going to be it. So thank you so much for taking some time. Stay tuned for the little show here.
Hi, my name is Ebony Chambliss, and I am the Clinic Practice Manager here at Odyssey Health Louisiana Community Health Center. My name is Dr. Chanam Hatuk. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for East Valley Community Health Center in West Covina, California. My name is Jason Barillo. I'm a physician assistant at Coastal Health and Wellness in Galveston County, Texas. I'm the medical director here at West Hawaii Community Health Center. I'm the safety manager here at the Sacramento Native American Health Center. And I am an HIV coordinator at Erie Family Health Center in Chicago, Illinois. I'm a pediatrician and the chief medical officer of the Dimmick Center that's been serving Boston, Massachusetts for over 150 years. We're a network of federally qualified health centers that serve over 115,000 people in the New York metropolitan area. For the past 15 years, Direct Relief has supported clinics and health centers because they are the safety net. They're the primary medical home for over 30 million patients throughout the country. It's amazing to me the work that this network of health centers and clinics does across the country, and, and frankly, how few people know about it because it's so integral to the healthcare system. Majority of our clients are uninsured, low income, homeless, experiencing substance abuse, and co-occurring disorders. We primarily see our working people that work in service-based industries. We have a very diverse population here where 76% are at or below the federal poverty line. Over 36% of our patients seek their care in a language other than English. And we have a large immigrant population as well as refugee population. So Demick serves the Boston neighborhoods that have actually been the local hotspots with some of the highest rates of COVID infections. So when the state of Louisiana decided to shut down due to COVID-19, our team knew we had to find a way to continue providing care to our patients because they were among the most high-risk population. As we began to respond, of course, we sent out masks, gloves, goggles, face shields, etc. But also we were hearing enormous financial pressures and strain that they were facing, many of whom were really stretching their last dollar to ensure that their doors could stay open. The last few months have been the most stressful I can ever remember in running this organization. COVID-19 has dramatically affected our program and our patient population, as they often live in crowded shelter environments or on the street, where practicing social distancing is impossible and the risk of transmission is very high. They are a vulnerable group. If they were to become infected, they have a much higher risk of serious complications. Things like job loss and social isolation, food insecurity, loss of childcare or school, there's just been so many stressors. Back in March when the pandemic hit our communities, we had to quickly transition to telehealth services and use our clinics as COVID-19 testing centers. We did have to operate with a limited crew though, limited resources and a skeleton crew. Uh, we were able to make it through, but it was very difficult. We are now operational, but can only see a fraction of our patients at physical facilities. So the rest is being done via telehealth. And we've been providing over 100,000 telehealth visits with our patients, trying to keep them out of the emergency room and give them advice about what to do during this COVID pandemic. We knew we had to do something more. So we created the COVID-19 Response Fund for Community Health. The aim of this fund was to mobilize financial resources so that they could keep their doors open and treat as many people as possible. Direct Relief ended up receiving over 600 applications that we ended up funding for a total of close to $30 million. It was the largest funding effort in Direct Relief's history. Let me say that this has caused financial stress on our organization unlike anything I've seen in our 35-year history. So I'm incredibly grateful for both the financial and material support we've received from Direct Relief. The Direct Relief funds have really allowed us to ensure that we don't have to lay off any staff or have to cut back services. As we take care of those that are potentially sick with COVID-19, you see behind me our external triage tent that we've been taking care of these patients for the last two and a half months. It allow our patients to have increased access to behavioral health services in this really difficult time. Without these donations, we couldn't have expanded our testing capabilities or telehealth services as we did. We have been able to consistently provide a safe working environment for both our staff and our patients throughout our clinics. In our community, there has been a recent surge in cases, so we know we're not out of the woods yet. 
but we are much better prepared for what is to come and what we will have to do to continue to serve the health needs of our community. As we have been for over 15 years, deeply committed to the work of health centers, our support is aimed at ensuring they have the PPE on hand and increasingly the financial resources to be able to continue their mission.